Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in about five minutes, so grab coffee, water, snacks, whatever you want. Three minutes. Seems to be working. Hi, everyone. Maybe we get started. Hi, morning. Welcome. We're so glad you could join us. And special welcome to our guests from Taiwan. We have AU. I'm not going to use last names, so I don't butcher them, but also we'll be friends by the end of this. So. AU, Avros, Shu, Shu Yang, <laughs> Patricia Tiffany, and Fang. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, over the next, so I just sort of talk about the way we've, you know, been thinking about this workshop and what we've been hoping to get at here. So the next two days, what we will hear. Um, from, from our guests from Taiwan is all of the experiments they've been doing around how citizens and government can collaborate and, and tackle really difficult issues and craft legislation and policies and programs uh, together so we can all sort of govern how we live um, in a collaborative uh, fashion. 
And in turn, it would be really great if, uh, if you can share your expertise and experiences and stories uh, with everyone, whether you're in government or private sector or an activist design. We have a lot of different backgrounds here. So this, this is an opportunity for all of us to, to get to know each other and, and share our experiences and, and ideas and, and hopefully build a practice or a community of practice around new approaches to governing ourselves and, and thinking about our communities and societies. Um, some logistics, uh, the Wi-Fi password is up there, PPNY, Prime Produce One, bathrooms on, on both sides of the openings that are two on either side. Um, our, we want to thank our partners, Composites Collective, the Awesome Foundation, Serapis, Beta NYC, Civic Hall, everyone's contributed uh, in these really amazing, excellent ways. ThoughtWorks, a special shout out to Prime Produce, um, which is the space in our hosts uh, for tonight. And Prime Produce is not just a location, uh, they are, and David gave me points to say, <laughs> they're a community of practice, no thanks David. <laughs> they're a community of practice committed to sowing a healthier tomorrow. And we've witnessed this first firsthand, their hospitality has been amazing and uh, coordinating with them is amazing. We actually like, we all built this space out together last night. Um, yeah, and it's been really fun. And they've, they've been supporting projects like us and projects with social and civic um, outlooks and uh, sort of aims for a very long time now. And I'm going to hand this to Shu Yang, who's going to introduce, yes? Oh, no, we're going to do icebreakers. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to hand this to CS, who's going who's gonna to do a quick round of icebreakers so that we can get to know each other a little bit better. Um, and then Shuyan. Good morning, everyone. All right, so for this little icebreaker, we're gonna have to get up and move around a little bit. Um, so here's how it works. It's called Constellations. I'm gonna read some statements, and you are going to identify with them as you please. If you really identify with the statements, we'll have you cluster up here. And if you don't, you can move kind of further to the back and then place yourself in the middle as you see fit, all right? Um, and then at the end of each statement, we'll offer an opportunity for anyone to like share why they place themselves, where they are, if you want to, you don't have to. But the idea of this is to just get a feel for who's here in the room and to help us all um, like see who's here, get to know each other. This is a super small and intimate group by design so that we can talk, so that we can share and communicate. So we hope that this uh, gives us a little bit of knowledge without having to do the obligatory go around the room and state your name game. All right, so let's keep this simple. For the first one, uh, yeah, this works better. For the first one, um, I'm excited to be here. If you're super, super excited, you can stand here. If you're mildly excited and not awake, it's okay. We won't judge. You can go a little bit further to the back. Fabulous. Well, this is excellent. Now we all know we're on the same page. Would anyone like to share why they're excited to be here or why they're interested in being here? Just a short snippet. If not, ah, perfect. Please state your name and where you've come from when you do. Uh, hi, my name is Noel. Noel, uh, I'm a Gemini. I have two names. It's perfectly okay. I'm from Beta NYC. Uh, several years ago, I met this uh, wonderful open source hacker, CL, and he was talking about some of the practices, and it was so fortunate to have him come through town via Liz Berry. Um, that was almost like three years ago to hear about the different work that all the work that's being done in Taiwan um, And so it's been exciting to see how that movement has grown um, And so happy to be here to actually be taught by the people who have been participating uh, in that leadership So I'm really excited to learn from all of you Anyone else? There's no pressure All right, let's make a new constellation I work for or in government. So if you work for or in government, please stand up here. If you don't, stand there. And if maybe you 
collaborate or consult with government, you can put yourself in the middle. <laughs> All right, so take a look at the spread, see who's in your close constellation group, who's not in your close constellation group. Would anyone in the government group that's not from Taiwan like to share which government you work for or where you're coming from? Sure. Um, I'm Adrian Schmoker. I work for the government of this place, this city. I work for the city of New York. I work in the mayor's office of data analytics. I'm Cordelia. I work at 18F in the U.S. federal government. Um, although our lawyers would probably really like me to say that I'm here on my own time, so love you. All right, fantastic. So how about this? Let's try another. Oh, does anyone else? Nathan Story. I work for New York City government as well. Um, although I am on child care leave right now, so I'm on here at my own time. <laughs> Great. All right, let's try one more and see what we have for the room. So how about this? I work at a research institution lab or think tank over here that may or may not be associated with government and everyone else that way. <laughs> All right, so I'll open up I'll open up the whole floor for anyone that would like to state where they work or why they place themselves where they are. Yeah? I'm Stephanie Sung. Um, this is my colleague, Joe Karaganis. We're both from the American Assembly at Columbia University. And uh, we just ran a, a small pilot project with Polis in Bowling Green, Kentucky. All right, how about this? I have been experimenting with the tools, methodologies from the Taiwan. So this is either if you've used Polis or Slido or you're working with some of the facilitation methods in any capacity, if you have or you haven't. Here, if you have, if you are, over here, if you haven't. <coughs> All right, folks over here like to share how they're using these tools. We've heard from, have we heard from us everyone? Devin, do you wanna? I'll put you on the spot. I mean, I, I had the, the privilege of running for office uh, trying to promote these, uh, these tools here. So got maybe 30 to 40 uh, inputs, um, the polis the polis and also the Madrid style uh, city council voting platform, Decide. I'm Devin. Devin, Devin. It sounds, it sounds hard with the microphone. She's also going to <laughs> okay, how about this? I'm pretty new to V Taiwan. Maybe I've read articles, I've seen some talks, but I'm still kind of wrapping my head around what's what this process is. Over here, if you're closely affiliated, and over there would be like, I know what's going on here. <laughs> so I'd expect to see some <laughs> movement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this might be one of the most interesting shapes. We've got some new, some in the middle, some on the edge. So how about over here, for the folks that are relatively new, what brought you here, why are you here, why are you excited to learn about these methodologies? Anyone like to put on the spot? Yes. I read your blog post with Darshana, I guess, on Civic Hall. Um, so that was a couple months ago. and. 
I didn't think I would ever see those people. So it's really cool to uh, see it actualized in New York right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Casey. Anyone else over here? Hi, I'm Dino. Um, I use all pronouns, so however you feel, call me like that. Uh, and I work at the GovLab and been designing some public engagement models with Latin American cities. And I was about to start exploring how police works and what you were doing, so this just comes perfect timing. Fantastic, yeah. Uh, I run, my name is Nikki, I run a, um, Girl parking sign redesign project and in doing that and talking to some cities I realized so there are some cities that are piloting the signs and a couple that I've spoken to who are sort of on the fence and in talking to them realized that there was no basically asked them what what needs to be true for you to run a pilot and realized in that process that there was like no formal process really for them to um, gauge public opinion of any sort and so I thought this was um, I was curious about how, how this whole thing worked. Fantastic. Okay, so the last one. Um, I believe we can alter and change the future of democracy to be more participatory and inclusive. If you really think this is the case here, and push yourself back, and it's okay. We can be skeptics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. We've got a lot of clusters here and the little out here. Do you want to share why you're, yeah? Noel or Noel again. Um, I'm not all the way against the wall, but I'm just skeptical because there's a lot of private financial interest that controls government and it's really hard to fight that. So it's a constant vigilant battle. Thank you for sharing, it's very important. Anyone in the close affinity group that wants to share? Yeah, there we go. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Stempeck. Um, I'm working at Civic Hall right now, more than anyone else, I guess. Um, I, I hear you know. I also think that there's so much we can improve that that's a lot of opportunity and that actually designing and educating people around new tools helps them do what they've always wanted to do, uh, but maybe didn't have a process for it before. Not that it's like going to be easy, but that I think tools like this can really help that happen. Hi, I'm David Colby Reed. My affiliations are several FUSA, New School, MIT Media Lab. And I, um, the reason why, I, I mean, I think like there's a big tension between democracy and expertise, like broad based participation and subject matter expertise. And so I'm interested in tools that help like uh, collapse some of that distance and allow for, you know, like, uh, like really, I think I think like a lot of uh, policy interventions have focused on like, oh, can we do uh, a new program or a tool and not a new method? And so I'm really interested in methods that help bridge that gap between participation and expertise. So that's just a little bit of. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating. That was our icebreaker. Get to set the stage and get to know each other a little bit more. So I hope that helped you identify who's here too and you found folks that you can chat with and connect with throughout your time here. So I'm gonna pass it off to Xu Yang for an overview, the PDES team. Cool, thank you CS. Okay, so hi everyone, um, yay. <laughs> We're all here, half, the, half of the Vitao and the team is here today and tomorrow, uh, most of the time of this week also. And we've been here for uh, a couple of days to set up the place and it was a very uh, great time to, to, to sit with you all and uh, um, prepare for the event. So uh, I'm going to give a little, uh, a very brief in 
uh, introduction of uh, my team, please. Um, maybe I can introduce a bit who uh, we are over here from Taiwan. Um, maybe firstly, Audrey, Audrey Tan, the digital minister with our portfolio of Taiwan. And, uh, <laughs> right. and our design consultant, Fang Rui Chang, over there. She'll be hosting the workshop tomorrow. And uh, everyone who's busy with the slides, thank you. <laughs> She'll be hosting the V Taiwan uh, workshop today, mainly uh, after our introduction. And um, we have two uh, participate, participation officers from uh, National Development Council, uh, Tiffany, and from uh, Co Agriculture uh, Com Committee of Ag Agriculture. Uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> nice. Right. And also, also Zach. Zach is uh, the right hand of Audrey and the chief uh, secretary of uh, our office. Yes. Mm. Oh, yeah, and that's me. So I'm Shu Yang. <laughs> I'm, I'm also working in the PD's uh, office. And PD stands for Public Digital Innovation Space. It's a, a new office started from 2016, from one and a half years ago. And we are an innovation lab sort of unit uh, um, working in the central government. And our main task is to work on opening the government from inside the government. Uh, yeah, so I can go with my slides then. Hmm? Yeah. Hmm, there you go. So again, I'm Shri Yang Ling. Um, I work as the re-architect of PDS, and PDS stands for Public Digital Innovation Space. Uh, in the beginning, actually, me and Audrey and uh, Zach, we three together uh, from the very first day, we sat and come up with this name because we think it should be public and digital in innovative, and should be a space that is without any wall to divide people from with, uh, inside and outside of the office. And our um, our team is, uh, has this very decentralized uh, culture, meaning there's no, merely no hierarchy uh, in our team. Everyone can uh, ask or request anything we want to work on. And we, we work on the, opening, uh, the open government uh, from within. And many of us, or some of us, are from a community, a civic tech community called GovZero. So how many of you have heard of GovZero? Well, that's quite a lot. So. <laughs> Um, we, in GovZero, there's a um, motto called fork the government, meaning if the government has already provided some service, then we try to create a, a fork and try to make it better and hope the government would merge it back. <coughs> and if the government hasn't pr provided anything we want uh, yet, then we'll just try to make a new I'm version. Sure the very okay. Yeah, I'll bring this here. Yeah? yeah? Better. Cool. Um, yeah. So there's another thing we have, another concept uh, we have. It's called Be Nobody. This concept is called, uh, it's about don't, when, when, when you think there's nothing haven't been done yet, you, may, you might be asking why nobody has done it already. Um, but our <clears throat> culture is to be let nobody, meaning don't ask why nobody did this. Um, just first admit you're let nobody and take action first. So after um, we joined uh, the government and we started pop, uh, PDs, not police, um, we had some ob observations to the government and we took some actions according to them. So I'll just quickly go through some of them. The first is um, the... Um, processing government um, through communication is pretty slow. We've observed from the beginning. And our action to it is to actually recruit many uh, passionate public servants. So we send out a recruit uh, poster uh, on one of the electronic uh, boards on the internet and ask for people to join our office and create a virtual network in the central government. And then we uh, encourage them to be brave and ask for help whenever they need it. Um, and we, are, we also observed uh, that they are not only uh, uh, 
good in writing. They're, they're good in writing, but I, we have many people in our office good at, good at listening. So Audrey actually has her office hour every Wednesday from, in the beginning was from 10 to 2, and now it's becoming from 10 to 10. Yeah. <laughs> every week. So there's an open space uh, in the center of Taipei City. You can just go there and book her time and talk to her. Um, yeah. And then after a few months when the, when the network became more and more mature, the POs or participation officers, they started to um, create this culture of bringing topics they want to discuss about to the, to the monthly PO meeting. Um, and and started to find out there are more projects that needed a cross uh, ministry collaboration. So we started to have people helping us to empower PO to work on workshop stuff. Um, uh, so mainly um, we are bringing um, uh, concepts like from surface design, from, uh, from civic tech community to, to help and empower POs to work on their daily work. <clears throat> Right, and the goal is not only to have PDs work with PO only, it's also to have POs uh, work in their ministries. Uh, eventually, they will spread this culture of collaboration uh, with uh, a greater group of people uh, in the end. And we also document everything and, and bring the survey uh, design concept to, to, to the government, meaning bringing the user to the very beginning of the process and try to create this collaborative culture. <clears throat> so, uh, in a nutshell, we call this whole movement uh, prototyping future democracy. Um, and I want to share a bit about how it happened. Uh, maybe some little bit of background of how Taiwan has all this thing happened from a few years ago. So, this movement rides on years of revolution of public participation in Taiwan because uh, from around 10, 20 years ago, um, public participation has been uh, developed in several formats. From you can see a face-to-face -face public hearing uh, from maybe 20 years ago, and then you have um, TV, TV uh, debate, uh, uh, election debates over TV or radio broadcast. People can have telephone coins, and we start to have um, a live stream uh, debate over the internet. So you can see this trajectory. Uh, coincides quite nicely with the, the advancement of technology. When um, technology arrived, dem democracy also evolved through, um, through that. <clears throat> and around uh, four years ago in 2014, there's a movement called Soundflower Movement. That's when we have this new trend uh, of technology called uh, self-media. When people uh, or digital natives, uh, they are not afraid of using uh, you know, becoming YouTubers or posting videos or selfies online. Um, that time, the Sunflower Movement also uh, started, and, and the students in Taiwan wouldn't bear with the unwillingness of MP to discuss on the surface trade deal with the Beijing office. Uh, they actually occupied the parliament for 22 days. And with uh, all the process, the deliberation process uh, um, conducted inside, and with everything um, recorded and live streamed over the internet. And after that, um, there's a sense, there's an atmosphere in Taiwan. Um, people are requesting to have a platform to allow the entire society to, uh, to, to work together, to think together, and have rational discussions. And then, um, the former minister with our portfolio in charge of cyberspace, Jacqueline Tai, she uh, materialized this idea with a sentence and proposed that idea in one of the GovZero's hackathon saying we need to have a platform to allow the entire society to engage in rational discussion. And that was the start of eTaiwan. So today, Everos will, uh, will talk and host most of the introduction of eTaiwan and will have a simulation on how it actually works. Um, and, but I will just introduce it very briefly a little bit. eTaiwan is actually not only a platform nor a website, it's also a consultation process um, for a society to come together and discuss about social issues and uh, really have uh, 
influence in regulations. So if you look at Vital One, it has several touch points, like a website, a process, hackathons, and uh, consultation meetings. And uh, every case in Vital One are different. Um, it has a process, but the process is a default process. Everyone can uh, change the process also. They can uh, propose to, to, to have a modification to the process uh, in the weekly hackathons. Um, but every case come to Vital One are different and they, they go with different phases on the process. So it will be very uh, important to see how do we decide each step uh, transparently. And if you come to Vital One's hackathon, you will see uh, participants, uh, they are always different. So maybe one day you will see a bunch of uh, uh, hackers they are working on, this, on the website, but maybe a few months later, there'll be another uh, group of people working on the same website and uh, making design and so on. And people come with, uh, people join, join Vital One's hackathon with different background, and most of the time they're attracted by the cases discussed on Vital One. Uh, when Uber case was discussed, uh, you can see Uber drivers or taxi drivers, they can discuss. And when unmanned avi aviation vehicle case was discussed, you can see um, people uh, like a uh, drone vendor or people in charge of uh, this regulation will be in the discussion. Yeah, and um, so Vital is an ongoing experiment. Um, in, the, in the beginning, we uh, see <clears throat> we are trying to have this fellowship model um, to try the Vital One open consultation process. And now in, in this moment, um, after, after we fought Vital One into the government, we're also have, having, uh, asking ourselves this question of if Vital One should be institutionalized as a regulation or not. So I will probably pass on this question to today's discussion. Um, and the next challenge was to look at the three elements we introduced, the case, introdu uh, introduced the case, the process, the participants, to make it more uh, scalable, sustainable, and, and diverse. Yeah, so after, after we uh, um, keep doing on this uh, experiment of v one we also work on something um, more uh, more ex experiments. We start to use uh, the tool called Polis um, that is um, made by some people over here. And we start to play with them to make it more inclusive and uh, more playful to, to people who ever want to participate. So one of the experiments uh, is uh, Holopolis chatbot. We try to uh, put, use Polis API and make a chatbot and uh, so that the Vita user can not only uh, come to the website, but actually the website can come to them. So you can actually add friends uh, with a Slack account or a Skype account. And when you ask the, the chatbot what's the topic under discussion right now, then it will tell you uh, the ones under discussion. And the second experiment is called Holopolis Police MR. Uh, we try to uh, imagine a near future world where everyone can have um, probably a content lens with a digital layer in front of you. So you can discuss about social issue um, whenever you visit. So for example, if there's a pri priority seat over there, you can uh, have this layer of uh, a discussion and you can talk about your, your opinion about priority seats. And the last um, experiment called Holopus Wi-Fi, uh, Hi-Fi, not Wi-Fi, uh, it's where we imagine a virtual commons where people can log in and have discussion in the virtual space. So you can have more experiments inside, not only having a say to the, to the, um, to the pu public policy, but also you can try to prototype an experiment inside. Okay, so that's a very brief in introduction of what we've done, and I'll pass it to uh, Everos or CS for the rest, thanks. Thank you. 
The way you operate as a team is is very unusual, right? It's, it's unusual not just for government, but unusual in general. Um, and what challenges have you faced in in sort of sticking to your guns and and operating in this this leaderless fashion within government? Well, see, um, so when I was appointed digital minister, uh, that's 2016 August, um, I waited for a month um, before, because I was independent contractor, consultant with Apple. I have to give them a 30-day um, notice. So during that 30-day notice, there's a very public negotiation going on because I don't accept, um, you know, private interviews. So all journalists, they can ask me anything, but I only answer publicly. And so they build upon each other's um, questions and also the public also. So um, the idea of uh, this kind of white, open, multi-stakeholderism uh, was communicated with the society for an entire month. So um, people gradually learned that what I mean by me being a conservative anarchist, uh, which is a more radical way of saying a Taoist, but same thing, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's that uh, it's all voluntary. So while Peters does have like 20 something full-timers, 30 something interns, uh, every year everybody joins voluntarily. Uh, but because that was my kind of condition going into the government, um, people learned that I'm not going to look at a minister of defense or minister of foreign affairs <laughs> or whatever and, and force them to do things uh, our way. So because it's all voluntary, I think there's no challenges or resistance. It's mostly because people know that we're a public service um, public servant, right? So we, we service the public service, not, not the other way around. So uh, as a purely facilitative minister, um, I was able to just present our presence in the national central government just to people who really want those innovative methods without us, you know, commanding or forcing uh, it to them. And so just, I think initially people who joined was just driven by curiosity. But after a few cases that went pretty successful, uh, people started joining for the credit it, not, not just uh, for reducing risk and, and for, for automation. That's the short answer. Yeah. Thank you. Have other ministers started adopting your ways? Yes, actually. Uh, we, we work very closely with the National Development Council, the, the NDC. Um, and in fact, we, we work on basically the research arm is the Vitae one. And whenever we settle on some methods or some components and things like that, that works pretty well. Uh, the NDC will adopt it at the joint platform. And so it's always a research and deployment relationship uh, between PDIS and the NDC. And the NDC also coordinates uh, training programs with not just other ministries, but also local governments. So for example, the joint platform is not just a petition or uh, open spending or regulatory pre announcement program, but it's also evolving to become the participatory budget program uh, for local governments. So the NDC people spend a lot of time with the local government and regional governments and try to infuse this kind of um, open innovation thinking. Uh, the other direction, uh, not with the NDC, is with the presidential office. So the presidential office uh, organized this three months long presidential hackathon using more or less the same ideas and methods here. And because it's a presidential office, they could get a lot more data than we could, uh, and it could uh, work across all the different branches of the government. And the uh, winner of those, the five winner of this annual presidential hackathon, there's no monetary reward. There's a very nice looking trophy, but there's no monetary reward. The reward is for those five innovative ideas to become part of uh, public service um, starting next year. And so, so that kind of innovation is also being adopted on a presidential uh, scale. So basically, we're, we're the ones who prototype and research and fail a lot and very publicly. But if we settle on something that really works, then it gets uh, propagated upward and, and downward. Yeah. That's incredible. So I, sorry, I just want to clarify if I understand. So um, I'm going to try to say what I understand so far and correct me if I'm wrong. So you are the experts on digital services, but you have a specific methodology. So you tell government, you want to work with me under my methodology voluntarily. voluntarily, but under legally you have no binding power or authority over any other branches of government. That's exactly right. Yes. Yes. There's no digital ministry. Yeah. yeah. All the binding power came from the participation officers. 
So the POs, um, they're, they report to their CIOs in each ministry. And we're just a facilitator to facilitate the PO network. That, that's the idea. So every ministry, like 30 of them, has a team of participation officers. That's by regulation. We, we have a regulation for them to set up this network. But my position in it is just as a facilitator. I can't really force any participation officer to do anything. Yeah. Okay. And do you work with uh, agencies that may have sensitive information or things that you cannot do open because of the nature of the information? So in that case, they just don't come to us. Right? They don't come to yeah. us. Okay. <laughs> because it's voluntary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Real quick, um, what what percentage of these thirty ministries uh, would you say the, the the bosses of the POs, the the CIOs, are like? This is the best thing, or you know, yeah, like what percentage of them are? Would you say the CIOs are allies versus just like not particularly enthusiastic or view this enterprise as uh, dangerous? So half of the ministries actually have to work very closely with constituents uh, and protesters and <laughs> petitioners. And, and for them, uh, it's gradually seen as a way to leverage the power of the, the new power, the horizontal power, um, to, to channel them into uh, really contributors um, of their, their mandates. But for the less um, citizen-facing ministries, I'm talking about the ministries of HR, right, uh, of internal um, movement and issues, um, they they took, it took us a year or so to see the public servants themselves, the frontline staff and so on. They're also constituents. They're, they're also potentially um, petitioners. And if you just set up the space just right, they will also fight for their well-being. <laughs> and and it, it also makes a lot of sense to include them early in the uh, participatory process. So there's two waves. The first wave is the more... <laughs> Uh, citizen-facing ones, uh, like the Council of Agriculture right there. <laughs> and then uh, the second wave is the more public servant-facing ones. And there are, of course, still ministries that primarily deal with, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That, that is one of the ministries that we uh, work closely for, um, like public relationship <laughs> and then other campaigns, but they don't yet use this methodology uh, to um, use citizen inputs to inform trade service agreements, negotiation and things like that. So I think there's the third wave, like they're traditionally not dealing with any Taiwanese citizen, really. Uh, they're, they're, their main constituents are abroad or around some other ways, but they are still not um, like resistant. It's just there's less cases less people go to the streets because of that ministry. So I think it's just a natural um, um, correspondence between how much they have to face citizens uh, and how much uh, they want to adopt these methods. Hello. Um, is there any fiscal requirement that you have set up for other agencies to like pay you or do you accept payment from other agencies? Is That's there, a like, very 18F question. Uh, <laughs> a, a fee for service or do you, you, you know, like, are, um, are you required to charge other agencies or do you have a voluntary charging model? Like, how do you, do you recuperate any costs? as a government agency? Right, so um, the, the short answer is that we ask for human resources. We don't ask for budgets. So in many cases, when an agency want to work with this method, we ask them to allocate a team according to the criteria of skills that we, we identify as needed for that particular case. And they do have to pay for the expertise and uh, um, HR requirements. Um, but no, our, our service itself, because we use exclusively um, free software and gratis software. So there's very little that needs to be paid operation-wise if you have the right people at the right points. Um, part of the GovZero's very thrifty innovation method is that we know all the ways to uh, use uh, software in that um, zero uh, cost uh, to, to achieve uh, methods. So I think uh, we, we, that's one of the ways we resist uh, hijacking by private sector vendors. Uh, we always find open source alternatives. And if they start being proprietary, like Polis, we use peer pressure to convince them to open source. <laughs> so so that's, that's one of the ways. That, that we move forward without requiring monetary like licensing fees and things like that. 
Are there more questions? I don't want to monopolize. But uh, so, uh, what would be like your wish, uh, your three wishes in terms of you've opened so far participation? Who is getting to you, and who are you not being able to get to attract? And what are your wishes or your thinking around to get to the people that haven't uh, been involved so far in, in what you're doing? That is right. That is one of the pivotal points in the V Taiwan uh, history um, is that we start handling only digital issues. But uh, for some issues, like there, there was a call to for the company law to include a special chapter on benefit corporations and social enterprises and things like that. And we discovered that the Primarily, the stakeholders, they may be on the internet, but they're not used to um, communicate in a written way. Um, and, and even they follow all their live streams or, or whatever, it still doesn't translate into a, you know, actionable participation, right? So instead of bringing them to the website, we need to bring the technology to people, right? Which is why we organized some 15, right? Um, tour uh, around Taiwan, so just to all the different regional places and like indigenous places, rural places, anywhere that has social entrepreneurship going on, and just me and the crew are listening to what they have to say in their natural habitat, but using live stream and all those things uh, to capture uh, what is going on in the town hall, and people in Taipei, like 12 different ministries, using teleconference, they have to respond to their inquiries in real time, so just like really v Taiwan style, but, but using teleconference conference to bring the uh, regions together. So that's one of the uh, necessary process improvements uh, that we did because the constituents are located and their preferred modality of action is not that of a written or yes or no questionnaire. Right? So, so we do adapt the process a lot based on the constituents. Okay. No. no? Yeah. Um, what was the name of the annual hackathon? The presidential hackathon? Yeah, it's just the presidential. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, maybe this isn't the right time for this question, but I'm wondering, just thinking comparatively about how other governments, city level or national level, um, uh, structure their digital in innovation initiatives and uh, what, I don't know if you've done any sort of comparative thinking about how these initiatives emerge around the world and what the advantages and disadvantages of the V Taiwan experience is in that context. Uh, on this very question, <laughs> but, but um, so so Taiwan, I think geographically and historically, there's some very different, um, I would say, unique points about Taiwan um, because we're like 23 million people, uh, but the internet use penetration rate, as measured by NDC, is over 80%. Yeah, yeah, it's over 80%, and it's very important uh, that our presidents, with her promise of broadband as human right, um, we see many countries uh, declaring that, but very few countries actually deliver, and we're one of the countries that actually delivers in the sense that in any indigenous or rural places, if it, you don't have broadband access, it's the government's fault. It's, it's the simple, right? So um, we basically say, uh, like the join website of the e-petitions and so on, of the 23 million people, there's about 5 million people now um, on it, like like regular users and, and things like that. So um, I think that's one of the unique points in that um, when we see digital gap or digital divide or whatever, instead of uh, shoehorning our process to fit the fact that there's some people who doesn't have broadband access, we just assume that they do have broadband access and fix it if, if they don't. And, and that's one of the, I think, very different things uh, it's more comparable to city level or Estonia city state level uh, um, philosophies than a, a really a large span uh, of country level digital services, which which will necessarily have to take care of heter heterogeneous um, digital connection um, situations. That's the first one, and the second one is that all the pressure of open government actually come from the civil society. That is a very different uh, from other, especially Asian countries, because Taiwan. Um, 
just 30 years ago, uh, lifted ourselves out of the martial law and the ban on just look at PRC today to, to know what's Taiwan like 30 years ago. So, so um, basically, it's a, it's a radical transparency. It's a call from the civil society so that people who still remember the martial law will not want to go back there, right? So, so all those absolute freedom of speech, of assembly, and so on, is taken as like the axiom uh, to the generation um, of my generation and the younger generations. So uh, we are seen actually as conservative uh, <laughs> units uh, in, in the, in the um, central government and the demand for even more radical transparency and participation is always there from a civil society. And we don't see that in other Asian countries. That's, that's the other uh, difference. All right. Thank you so much, Shu and Audrey and those that ask questions. Um, I'm going to give a short uh, overview of the GovZero network, or really the group of people that have put this together and how we got here, and also, I hope, uh, an invitation to anyone who is interested in continuing to work with these methodologies and tools and practices. Um, so really, we view ourselves as a collection of nobodies that was really moved by the work that happened in Taiwan. Um, and here today, we have uh, myself, Liz Berry, Devin, and Darshana, um, maybe some newer members like Nikki and Tina, um, and Christina, some other folks, and Cordelia. Um, and so I want to kind of share how we came together, because I think it's a really interesting story and adds to this vibrancy. Um, for us, I mean, there was Sunflower, and then there was this great article in the Civicus v. Taiwan Public Participation uh, Methods on the Cyberpunk Frontier of Democracy, written by Liz Berry. And uh, this was my introduction to v. Taiwan. Uh, so please chat with Liz about her experience being there uh, during our breaks. But Darshana introduced this to me. Darshana and I would meet in the park and chat about organizational structures. And we were both really moved by this and really like keen on understanding um, what was behind this and all the tools and methodologies. So, um, you know, some people bemoan that we didn't have like an Arab Spring with Twitter, but I'd like to say that Twitter was really kind of the catalyst of, <laughs> of how we all met each other. So I sent out these uh, tweets in June. I was working on a talk and I, and I was basically like, we need to start embracing this stuff. Um, this is really actually possible. Uh, no hashtags here, you'll see. I just kind of sent it out. And um, found out uh, later on that uh, that led me to, on the 18th of July, this is Cordelia. And I've known Cordelia for a few years, and this is yet another tweet. And Cordelia basically replies, it's hard to see, but she says, Deliber deliberative democracy in Taiwan and GovZero has been my major research focus for the last 12 months. I was like, oh my gosh, what? So we had a chat with Cordelia, and that kind of pulled us all together, and uh, so now we were more connected and chatting. Uh, and then what happens? Well... On July 24th, uh, basically, Shu here started doing some research and started to find all the mentions of V-Taiwan on the internet. And Liz Berry and another member who's not here, Patrick Connolly from Toronto, whose uh, tweet is featured here, were already in a Slack. And they reached out to us and they were like, hey, we are, um, we are, where's this thing going? Oh, looks like it's missing one here. Aha, here it is. Sorry about that. Where did that go? Aha, July 18th. We're going to meet, we're here in New York, we're all here in New York, and we're going to meet at Progressive Hack Night, which is a bi-weekly hack night that happens here in New York City. If you haven't gone, I highly encourage that you go. It happens at ThoughtWorks every Tuesday. Um, and it was our first. And Liz just like sent me a DM, and I had no idea. Darshan and I were hanging out, and I was like, Darshana, it's, it's Liz. It's the person that wrote the article. <laughs> like, what's going on? We're going to go meet them. Uh, so you can imagine that we're just like really excited. Here we are in our like little world, like really into this and trying to connect to people. Um, so that's what happened. On July 18th, we went and we uh, met Liz. I believe Devin came and also uh, Joe who's here, Joe came, um, and we had a small little chat about these tools and methodologies, and we're like, okay, wow, we're all connected now, this is great. Um, and then uh, this little back one, um, 
this week was really embarked. We met up again because Patrick, who lives in Toronto, is here, and we met up at Orbital NYC. And I know there's a few, there's a lot of folks here from Orbital NYC. I would just like to give a big shout out to them because I think that one of the things that we need as we embark on rethinking um, is spaces that let us gather. And so Orbital opened their doors uh, to us and let us come in as a group. And we've actually been meeting regularly there every Friday um, to organize this, and you're all like anyone who's interested is also invited to join. So that was our first week of meeting each other uh, here. Um, and then, so just to share a bit, we've also all been kind of working on our own little experiments. Uh, Pat Khan launched an experiment up in Toronto using Polis early on. And then um, Darshan and I launched an experiment in the summer called Talk to NYC, uh, which revolved around trying out some of these tools and methodologies to figure out, you know, could we increase participation? Are candidates actually interested in it? Uh, and then the really exciting thing happened. We went to Taiwan. And this is when we met Shu. <laughs> um, we went to Taiwan for a Civic Tech Fest, but really we went to go meet uh, meet the folks in Taiwan and try to like understand more really what, what's going on here. And this was also the first time that we were introduced to the PO network. And I remember listening to Shu's talk and being like, oh my gosh, there's a whole other piece to this puzzle. Wow, like this is incredible. So those who will be here tomorrow, you will get to hear about the PO network portion, which uh, we talk a lot about Be Taiwan, but there's a lot of uh, pieces at play. So it's equally as important. Um, and this is when we met Avros, who will be facilitating, and we got to attend a V Taiwan uh, uh, consultation. Avros is uh, working on the was a facilitator for the non-consensual images. Uh, got to go to the PETA's offices, just really like meeting who was there and just establishing relationships and friendships. Um, and then Darshan and I published our work also in Civicist. Uh, it's called Two Weeks in Taipei, and it's a list of our travels and uh, people that we met and interviewed. And yeah, so that kind of, that brings us to, to this point here today, and um, at least personally speaking for myself, it's really fascinating to think about this as about a year. So in about a year, we've gotten here, and so um, we now are super excited to connect and to open this up to other people who are interested, and um, you can join us. Um, GovZero.network is just a mailing list, but we really recommend that you come join us where we like really hang out, which is in the GovZero Slack. Um, when you get to the GovZero Slack, you'll get dumped into the general channel. If you look for a V Network channel, there's also VNYC, but V Network is where we hang out. Uh, please come, uh, come hang out with us. And also, over the next few days, as you think about like this network and um, your interest in being a part of it, I want to we'll post these out, but I would like to um, say that we are in the process of trying to establish an identity and logo, and I would like to thank Nikki, who's here, for taking the time to work with us on these. So these are some options. We'll print them out, you can like think about it, we'll have stuff up at the party, um, but if you're like, want to be a part of this or interested in it, think about which, which one of these might identify with you. Um, this one's pretty neat, the idea is that like every city or every location can kind of customize it and uh, make it make it their own. So yeah, I just uh, hope this was a nice little overview about how we actually got to this moment. Um, and really, uh, yeah, welcome to welcome to the V network. So we have uh, a little bit of time. We're going to take a break right now. Um, please feel free to grab coffee, grab snacks, uh, get some fresh air, meet some folks that you might be interested in chatting with. And we'll come back in around 15 minutes for the start of the V Taiwan consultation methods led by Avros. Okay, yeah, because it's 
today. Today. Today, yeah. The TW is off today. I this morning. I have more questions, but I don't know how she keeps asking. No, she keeps asking. No, she So we try to be as transparent as possible in our office. So not every uh, employee is subscribed to that. So meaning, um, also in Brazil, is very transparent. So every meeting we have will be recorded and transferred. Transcribed, and stored, and uploaded on the internet. There's a trick in our website. You can see all the meetings. Now there are thousands of them already. Yeah, so you can search. Yeah. I can I can show you. Uh, do you have a similar you know, track of no, because what's happening in the government? The thing, uh, the, the reason I'm asking is because many governments, government ask us how to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, so, for example, when you say, this is very specific, but when you say transcribe, transcribe. Like, we hire someone who is the fastest, fastest person. type of communication, a person. But now she's getting uh, help from a uh, robot. Okay. Yeah. Because she, when she type Chinese, it's a uh, it's a uh, hassle to change different with that input source. You know, so the robot is helping her on English. Part. So far, there's nothing. Yeah. So this is the track we have. Yeah. Uh, see all the meetings from 2016 to to now. Yeah. All the talks. Words. <laughs> everything with transcription or YouTube videos. It just goes on. Yeah, but there's not a technology that does it automatically. No, no, no. But yeah, I saw that in conferences. I'm not sure. I think I feel that Mandarin uh, voice to text translation will be soon. Within these two years. Yeah, it's not, it's just that governments never want to pay. They are no, like, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's cost associated. Yes, cost. It's around 30 bucks an hour. Do you have an idea? Is this used? Like, is there a demand for this data? Or is there just there for nothing? So I used it to prepare for slides. So you can go, always go back to meetings and what they talk. And how people have been talking about different ideas to other people. So it's, I think it's very helpful for, for the team. Uh, for, for the journalists, they use it a lot too. Yeah. We also have a special protocol for journalists. Uh, when they want to interview us, it has to be open source. So all the questions they ask will be open source. So the next journalist wouldn't have to ask again. Although in the real life, uh, people still ask the same question again and again. Because that's their discipline. So what, what was your work in Comic Club? Yeah. Recently we met with some justices of the Supreme Electoral Court in Mexico. And they have the figure of private audiences that they want to make public. But they were wondering how that. So I, that's why I'm asking just to understand the process because yeah. I see like a lot of. I, I feel like there's going to be demand for more. 
arm is running clean like this way, but just like streamlining it so to lower the cost of being open and like doing something like to pick it up. Yeah. Like, do you have a data like visualization of this? Do you know what you're doing?
In a few minutes, we'll get started with the next portion of the training. So if you want to grab coffee, water, and wrap up your conversation soon. Good people together. Not yet. <laughs> In a minute. I'll let you all do it. Is that they don't know what they need. Same for like for pyramid. It's like they are not experts in that. If we could all make our way back to seats. What do you need? If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. All right, we're going to get started again. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I just want to also uh, give a big thanks to Jolly, who's here from the Internet Society, who's recording everything. We will be uh, editing this down, and our goal is to release a video of this training so that folks can take this back and share it uh, with other people. So keep your eyes out for our Kickstarter next month. All right. Turn it over to Avros to get us started with the VTaiwan consultation process. Great. Well, hello. Clear. Okay. Huh? Closer. Like this. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, since I have my audience in live streaming, I should do a live show, right? All I need is a guitar and like. <laughs> Okay, and a hat right there, collecting money. Uh, <laughs> okay, I know I'm, I'm a volunteer at, at, in the government, so I do this for charity. <laughs> uh, I'm Evros, and it's my pleasure to give an introduction, a probably brief introduction on VTaiwan, and firstly about its historical background, then the methods, culture, and then some I'll bring to case studies. And uh, I'm a senior legal consultant. And because uh, most of the cases on Vita one were resolved with policy regulations and uh, legislation. So that's probably uh, why I was, I was needed in this process. And uh, I used the subtitle as how did democracy go from offline to on, on offline. And generally it was, it was offline. Uh, it was online, but then I and I thought because uh, it's not just online. We want to see people like meet in person and feel what they feel and to talk and to interact with them in person. So then I borrowed this term from HTML attributes, and it's a it's a on offline. I think that's a good mix of online and offline. Yeah, it's just a little nice thing. Uh, and first of all. Uh, True. Thanks, True, for just giving a brief. Uh, it's like a trigger in the historical background of the Taiwan, and we can't. I mean, we just keep talking about the sunflower movement in 2014 because it's really important. And it's just some quick facts. And I believe some of you might have already read lots of news and pieces on this movement. And yeah, just the timing from March 18th to April 10th, lasting 23 days, and it's a protest against the deal, a deal with the Beijing China, it's a, it's a trade deal, and the, the then government lost its legitimacy of passing this 
deal. So um, the students and the communities they went on the street and doing a went uh, did a protest and they raised the awareness of open source community and uh, citizen particip participation. So that's when um, like it's like a seed uh, spreading the seeds across the Taiwan. So and also. Um, uh, the Gov Zero community in Wachow, that's when they got its popularity across Taiwan. And then uh, in the, at the end of December, uh, at the end of 2014, uh, Jacqueline Tsai, the then Minister Without Portfolio, uh, she went to a hackathon of Gov Zero and she proposed that we need a platform to allow a uh, rational discussion. So that's like a uh, this this proposal kickstarted uh, Be Taiwan, and so here it is. And I heard that within two weeks, like in two weeks, Be Taiwan was born. And I believe that uh, Audrey contributed a lot to this this forma uh, this formation of uh, the birth the birth of Be Taiwan. And this is the uh, URL. You can uh, check it on your laptop or a mobile phone. So since 2015, there have been 26 cases uh, of discussed through the return process. Uh, so, okay, we're then talk about the culture and the people, which are probably the most important part and the key that uh, makes Taiwan so great. Uh, and first, but I would like to share a book that uh, inspired me a lot. It's by Cass Sunstein. And he's a legal American legal scholar, uh, and the most frequently cited legal scholar from 2009 to 2013. And uh, I really like this book. Uh, it's a uh, divided democracy in the age of social media. It talks about a lot. Uh, it talks a lot about uh, the fragmentation and the polarization of ideas and uh, and comments on social networks. So it also uh, contribute this to um, the the uh, Facebook to the formation of echo chambers and there are two lines uh, cited from this book and I find it interesting because so, it said many people are mostly hearing more and louder of their own voices so it feels like uh, Facebook is like a mirror it's like reflecting yourself so what you see and what you watch on your Facebook feeds are probably reflecting what you are. So and also what uh, the data and the comments generated by you are just appears to be a product of your own values and identity. So uh, so this is just like the background of uh, what what internet or what social network are right now. And uh, under this circumstance, um, so we try to think about how we can build a uh, virtual or physical space that uh, give people or community mem uh, contributors autonomy and empowerment. Try to, and these are some of the uh, models that we do on V Taiwan, and like consensus-based process. So uh, the participants get to decide the process based on their own consensus. And also the agenda uh, uh, is participant oriented. So they get to know and they get to decide to determine what we are going to talk about uh, through the whole process. And also there is an idea call or rolling correction. So uh, we keep reflecting ourselves and improve ourselves by uh, reflecting or looking back at uh, what should be corrected and so it's like a rolling basis, and it's the model could be a, a recursive public, and I I think that recursive is a design term, which means um, an, in a repeated way, I guess so. Or Sue, you want to talk about that? Uh, what's a recursive public? So I always have this kind of yeah, sure, recursive public. It's actually a, a research, uh, it's a term coined by uh, Kelty Christopher. Uh, he has a paper uh, with a title named Recursive Public. Uh, it means you have this environment that is always interactive and participants inside can define 
uh, the rules, the uh, how they want to run the the space, and um, yeah, here's a paper around. So it. in a in a yeah. interactive way and then in a repeated way. Uh, it's like this place is, this public is is, uh, is kind of organic. Participants inside they can define what the space will look like and how it functions. Uh -huh. So it's recursive in a way and it's public because it's an open space. Oh, okay. So like open just, format. Just a little bit. Of, yeah. Okay. Then so it's also we have the open format and also like open source and open space. Like like what we have here is open and not closed. And also no strict rules, so it's also may overlap uh, the definition of consensus-based process and participant-oriented. So they get to choose uh, what they want and decide what the rule should be. Uh, so this is actually uh, how we deliver this uh, workshop. So every participant and organizer get to know uh, and get to speak uh, what they want to know and what they want to uh, think about. And uh, so uh, the up, uh, above mentioned uh, models can be summarized by a term called autocracy. And it's a term I have listed, uh, I have borrowed a definition from Oxford Dictionary, and it said uh, it's a system of flexible and informal organization and management. So this is just like the core spirit of v Taiwan, that's uh, autocracy. So it's like, um, it's the opposite of bureaucracy. So uh, it's, it's interesting that we have this kind of uh, spirit inside the central government. It's, sometimes I feel like personally it's like a protest against the existing system and the existing bureaucracy. So uh, while I do have some difficulties when uh, doing my own mission, uh, like when I do the, the, the volunteer work, uh, I don't feel like reported to my boss, but um, but the boss then may, might think that I haven't done so much. But then my boss is not Audrey. It's just because I work for an, a nonprofit organization. Uh, but um, my boss generally didn't realize what I have been doing actually, because uh, it's um, it's not a. I mean, the work that I have done. Uh, should be reported to the boss, but actually uh, she, she or he, and I mean, my supervisor maybe not agree with what I have been do as a volunteer because that would be like a, a huge cause without benefit to him or her, I'm not sure. So this is like the uh, personal difficulties working as a volunteer uh, in the opposite of bureaucracy. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I might a little bit digress, sorry. And <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the critical critical roles of V Taiwan that I uh, sh think I should, uh, I think I'm uh, worthy mentioning. Uh, it's the facilitator, editors, and contributors. But the facilitator can be one or two or more, but generally we have one facilitator to host a issue. And uh, these are the features that uh, the facilitator, editors, and contributors should have. It's like, like the facilitator should be knowledgeable about the issue, and he or she should participate through the pro process. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Uh, but we encourage the facilitator to participate as early as possible, and he or she should stay neutral and at best with no direct interest with the topic itself. And he or she should be familiar with the ORID method, which, should, which I would talk about later. And uh, the editors would be like uh, um, editors of the website. So he or she should be uh, capable of maintaining the websites. So it's in here, Vitaiwan, he or she should be capable of uh, like uploading the contents and know how to like login and passwords, and uh, you or she should know uh, where where the contents should be posted. So that's like a, a maintaining like editors of the websites, and should be responsive and active in V Taiwan community. So generally, you or she should participate in the hack mini hackathon regularly. So uh, that's that's what editors should do. Yeah. So like the third feature 
And the contributors can be anyone, anyone who is interested in, in this process or interested in a specific issue. So uh, it could be anyone. And so there's also some policy like on written rules that uh, they should behave themselves and be honest with themselves. So no lies. So because once you want to participate in uh, resolving a hot topic or issues and there is no need to lie. So that's uh, what our contributors should do. So these are uh, the three critical rules that I think I, sh uh, I think it's worth mentioning. And uh, these are the typical uh, scene of mini hackathon. And so you can see, uh, so here uh, it's Audrey and, oops, so here is Audrey. Uh, and uh, PDs like Sue and contributor, and they are maybe from various backgrounds like engineering or uh, an engineer or uh, a researcher or PhD program students. Um, and also maybe there may sometimes be a research team appointed by a competent authority. So, uh, so there's his uh, research team. Uh, sometimes for some case and also I serve as a editor of the Taiwan platform yeah okay so here comes to the process and maybe this uh, can give you a clear view of what exactly V Taiwan is and and also uh, please note that our upcoming sessions will be uh, divided uh, by the process according to the process Yes, so uh, later on for the afternoon, there will be a proposal, stage one, and then stage two, opinion, stage three, reflection, and stage four, legislation. And so our process is simple. There are four stages across the whole VTAR process, but also this is a, um, like a process, a participant-oriented agenda. So we try to not to be that institutionalized because institutionalization, are, uh, there's not much flexibility in institutionalization. But sometimes we still, uh, I mean, this is a process based on the consensus so far, according to the participants of v Taiwan. So this is what we have for, for now so far uh, of the process. But it can be changed. Uh, it, it can be, I mean, it can, it can be flexible. So it depends on what the participant wants. If, if someone can bring up a better process than if uh, he or she is, uh, is convincing enough, so all the participants and all agree, then we can change the process. But uh, this is what we have based on the consensus so far. And for the stage two opinion collection, uh, we generally host a online opinion collection survey. So it's right here. And also we will do that as a trial or experiment. And then for a stage three reflection, we will have a consultation meeting. Uh, this is how, uh, this is when the on offline happen. I mean, we do it live streaming and also in person. So, and you will see it later. Yeah, we, uh, we will be, uh, we will break this into details later. And also across the whole stages, um, there will be, there should be mini hackathons on Wednesdays. That's what we do um, for Vita One and occasional internal meetings throughout the whole process. Uh, so it's just kind of like filling the gaps between these stages. So whenever we need uh, to discuss more about some, like even about topic, substantial topic, or uh, procedural process, then we, to need, we can bring up these uh, issues on me, at mini hackathons. So then people get to know uh, what, what's, uh, people get to uh, keep track on what's happening. And sometimes, uh, according to, well, or if some um, public officials are not able to do that on Wednesdays, then we can uh, switch our, or be flexible with the process, and then we can host some occasional internal meetings, and remember to record it on the internet. We use uh, Hackpad as a record, as a recording uh, tool, 
So uh, people that cannot join occasional internal meetings, but they probably uh, participate on at a mini hackathon to get to know what's happening on Hackpad. And uh, this is my personal view on uh, what, how the idea flows converge and diverge. It's a diagram, but yeah, just my personal, personal perception on this. So firstly, uh, starting from the pro proposal stage, there may be like, uh, people may be like going extreme, like, uh, like an echo chamber or the polarization of ideas. And then throughout the process, maybe somehow, uh, like here, between the proposal stage and opinion stage, this may be how, uh, maybe um, how the idea flows converge. And then we bring up a online, online opinion collection, so into the opinion stage, and then we collect more opinions, and then somehow it may diverge at a certain point, and then go between the reflection and opinion and reflection, then we, uh, our editors or the facilitator and also the contributors can try to uh, th think about all the comments and we try to find out where the idea flows can converge. So, and then in the reflection, we have consultation meeting. So we have more com comments and opinions and ideas. So it diverge again and then uh, luckily and eventually it should all converge at a certain, uh, at a, the, the best level. So then we go into the legislation, but this is the best model or like the, uh, yeah, this is the, the most, um, best model of that should happen that can happen. But generally, uh, sometimes will diverge, I mean, too much. And then so when we were at the reflection, we have some comments, uh, unexpected comments or unexpected uh, solutions or problems and uh, I mean, out of our own expected range. So then we can go back to the opinion stage and to think about how we should narrow down our scope. So yeah, here's the word recursive public in an interactive environment. Yeah, so, uh, so this is just a diagram to show um, how throughout the whole four stages that Vita one can let the idea flows converge and diverge. Yes, and uh, here we have, I have two case study. One is uh, UberX and the second one is the NCII, non-consensual intimate, Im intimate image. Uh, UberX is, um, its feature including includes uh, being the first Vitamin case that used police and also to gather the highest number of votes. And also uh, it's a proposal that um, also um, that be top down and also bottom up because, um, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, so here's the timeline of UberX. So it's proposal happening on 2015. And then uh, we have a online opinion collection running for a month and then we go to and then we went into the reflection stage which is a consultation meeting in August and then in 2016 uh, we had the amended uh, legislation so also we have the mini hackathons on Wednesdays throughout the four stages uh, so this is just what I uh, just mentioned that we have a bottom down and so, sorry, bottom down and but top down and bottom up uh, proposal that because uh, we have requests, uh, we, we have the requests from several government authorities, including Ministry of Tele Telecommunication and Communications, uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs, and also Ministry of Finance. So they all think that Uber is a case that worth discussing and really need to be resolved. And also we have a topic poll at Mini Hackathon and uh, 30, 31 out of 33 think uh, this is a topic that worth talking, uh, worth discussing about. So, okay, uh, yeah, it means here's the Uber. Sorry, it's in Chinese. So, um, 
So we have this two way of request. One is top, top down and bottom up. And the other one is bottom up. So this is, this is how it makes it worth Uber K, Uber X, uh, worth, worth, worthy of mentioning. And so this is the stats of uh, police survey. We have 145 statements and 925 participants and the highest number of votes so far. Okay. And, and this is the screenshot of uh, the UberX online opinion collection. So you can see here is a group A and group B and we will go into the details of police later. So this is a a brief and uh, brief, sh to sh uh, brief example of how Vitaran works. And so, uh, the group A, uh, we, we have collected a majority. I mean, a consensus from group A that it says. Um, it, I think it is the responsibility of the ministry to actively outlaw online unlicensed passenger vehicle. And according to the group B. Um, some most of the participants in Group B think thought that uh, it's great to have Uber and e, Uber X, and it has subverted this on written rule. So they think it's, it was quite awesome. Um, also, uh, they think that um, I mean Uber X, according to the Group B, is like a really nice business model. So Uber X. Is quite welcomed in V Taiwan, and but also uh, both Group A and Group B agree that the rights of the diver drivers and the passenger, uh, the rights of both matters. So safety is the top priority. So even though uh, Uber X is well quite welcomed and widely known and used across Taiwan, but they, I mean both. All of, all of the passengers and drivers may all agree that safety is the top priority. So uh, here we have the suggestion from the majority. Uh, so it says that uh, the government should, the government should do something like a, have a having a fair regulation, and Uber has to address the tax issue, and also Uber should follow the rules of taxis, uh, and. Transportation should be regulated, just like just like food or drug, drugs, and uh, yes, UberX should be registered. So you can see that uh, people really care about the safety of passengers and also the drivers. So these are this, um, the consensus from the majority, and this is uh, the seating plan of the consultation meeting. Um, so you can see that here is the government sitting here. And here is like the, the scholar part sitting here. So uh, l later in our session, we'll also have this U-shaped table. And according to your dots, your color dots, that's the secret mission. According to your dollar dots, we have appointed uh, it as a different stakeholders. So then you will play like a play a role of the stakeholder and then you will be seated according to the seating plan. So here, um, here is like the civil society and here will be the corporates or corporates or the private se sectors. And here's the facilitator. So uh, we have this U-shaped table for the consultation meeting and this is, and also we will have a camera here uh, for live streaming. Yeah, so yeah, this is a, a like a preview of what we are going to do in the afternoon. Okay, so uh, based on the consensus collected from online opinion collection and consultation meeting uh, in 2016, uh, Ministry of Tele Telecommunication and Ministry of Transportation and Communication pledged to ratify all the police consensus and to amend the regulation, the related regulation of taxi. And so it came out on, in October. So uh, the amendment went into effect. So this is the achievement of uh, the Uber X case.
And then uh, here's the non-consensual pornography, but um, well, this is the widely used term, but somehow uh, we think that uh, non-consensual images may be better. Um, and this, this case has its feature uh, including, uh, it's proposed by one of the contributors, so it's a uh, bottom-up proposal. And the proposal serve as the facilitator, and he happened to be me, so <laughs> I can bring, uh, can share with my first person point of view of uh, hosting this uh, topic. And so this is the timeline of NCII case. Uh, so for in 2017, last year, uh, it was proposed in a mini hackathon, and then. Um, from June to July of, well, generally we have a one month opinion collection, but for, for NCI case, somehow we didn't have that much, that have that many of participants that we generally expected. So we extended it, uh, extended it with two more weeks. So then uh, we have a longer duration for online opinion collection. And then in September, we have the consultation meeting, and right now it's still pending. And well, uh, there are four draft bills uh, over uh, having or in part or as a whole discuss, discussing and try to resolve this problem in Taiwan. So uh, we still try to think about uh, the strategy of legislation so far. So, and we have lots of discussion and brainstorming at mini hackathon on Wednesday or some occasional internal meetings to think about how we should go into the next step. But now it's, uh, it's like in the middle of reflection and legislation. And maybe we can go back to opinion stage sometimes, but it's based on the consensus of the contributors at mini hackathon. So, uh, Back then, at the proposal stage uh, in April, we had the mini hackathon, and then I proposed the two statements. Uh, so, as general, uh, it's originally tried to uh, criminal criminalize the actor of NCI, and then maybe uh, you know according to Taiwan law, it may be included in the Personal Information Protection Act, but uh, throughout the whole process, I mean, over almost a year, uh, it has changed a little bit, but this was the or original proposal. Oh, and then here is the link, the URL you can access, you can have access to the, the, the hackpad to see the record, but it's in Chinese. Uh, and here are the stats, so you can see that we, we didn't have many participants, um, so this is um, it reminds it, it reminded me and it sets as an alert to me that we should focus more on the promotion and like the marketing of V Taiwan. I mean, it has to be viral, and we we don't well we we have a uh, Facebook uh, fan page and we did spread the news, but. And also, we also uh, communicated with a, a online community in Taiwan uh, focusing on women and feminism issue. But uh, well, we are not that successful on the promotion of this topic. Yeah, so we're still trying to think how we can improve this. So we only have like 100 participants, not like. Not like uh, what happened to UberX, but we have over uh, 10,000 10, views on the live streaming videos of consultation meeting. Okay, and this is uh, the, the screenshot of police collection, online opinion collection, and we have group A and group B, group B also, like the two groups. Uh, and this is, um, the well, because we 
we have talked a lot about how we should narrow down the scope of this topic because this topic includes lots of aspects, including the responsibility of I internet service provider or uh, the criminal, which, where, whether we should criminalize the actor and also how we should uh, um, improve the procedural process of law enforcement. So, but general, I mean, in the first place, we thought that we should only focus on the definition of pornography or the definition of intimate image. So, I mean, that's like the definition part, and it matters a lot in from a legal standpoint. So, uh, we have had the police uh, survey as a way to collect and way to collect how people imagine what intimate intimate images should be like so so for group a they th um, they think well i this is a, a subjective part as a facilitator so i like label group a as conservative group and label group b as liberal liberal group so the conservative the group a think that plants kissing should not be or should not account for bodily bodily intimate image and and also like sweet talk so yeah and group b think that even moaning or uh, men's nipples and the disclosure of one's sexual orientation could be could be seen as a bodily intimate images yeah so there are two different maybe at two different uh, ends of a spectrum so but for both the group A and group B, the consensus, I mean, over 75% think that, they all think that this act, like the non-consensual uh, intimate images should be a crime. And also it doesn't happen to couples only. So this is what um, the majority or the consensus uh, comments that we have collected on police survey. And this is the sitting plan of the consultation meeting of the CI case. And we have the, the format of the seating plan. So it's facilitators would sit here and, and above here would be the Gov government, including National Develop, Development Council, uh, and CEC National Communications and Committee, okay. <laughs> and, a Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health and Welfare, Ministry of Justice. Yeah, and also here are the uh, scholar, including lawyers and law professor. And TWRF is a nonprofit organization um, for uh, feminism and women. women. Uh, and also, uh, here we have a, a legislator representative here sitting here. Uh, and we kind of categorize this as a like, um, or it may be also be included, sorry. It may be also being seen as a civil society. But well, this is a another part that how we can, I mean, Vita One is under uh, the executive yuan, so it's in the executive branch so far, but once the legislation, I mean, the legislator would like to participate in, then we should think about uh, its role. I mean, what the legislator should be categorized as in this, I mean, as in the stakeholders. Yeah, so because um, we have like executive, executive, legislative, and gen okay, so, uh, so yeah, this is the cross branch um, problem, then we need to think about where the legislature should be, belong, should, where it should, uh, should belong to. Okay, so this is the, a brief introduction of the veto and veto and uh, historical background methods and culture and people. So do you have any kinds of questions or, because uh, we will go into detail of each stages and you can also have the chance to practice and to to feel i mean personally feel how it works so yeah or you want me to sing with a guitar <laughs> well <laughs> well i can do that 
Well, okay. So yeah, sure, Devin. Uh, Top of what? Uh, sorry. Huh? Uh, what's going on at the the top of the U across from the facilitators? Oh, there a here's presentation a projection. or project? Yeah. What? What do you? What do you? You mean, you mean this one? Yeah. The projection screen. Yeah. Like like what kind of content are you putting up there during these things? Are you putting up like statistics about the issue? Mm -hmm. Are you? Do you have like a live feed of other people who are watching on live stream? Like what's the what does that look like? It's for it's for uh, sometimes the facilitator will have a presentation or like like a s several slides for what have been happening so far to so just to keep people keep the participant tra uh, help them keep track of what's happening or the latest status and also uh, after the facilitation slides uh, the government or the competent authority of each topic should be uh, responsible for uh, representing or also doing a presentation or slides on what their role, what, uh, what their position is right now. So let people see uh, to understand what they have been, uh, what they have been doing uh, in terms of that specific topic and let them know, uh, I mean, and also what research that they have been done to let the participant know. So this, uh, and after the presentation of the competent authority, the facilitator can also utilize the projection screen as a, like, like I use right now, as I notes. Uh, so I can write down anything I want and let the participants understand what's in my mind and what I have learned and listened from the uh, participants. So I can like do a summary and just keep writing and let them know the, the the mind of the facilitator. Yeah, so that's the purpose of the projection screen. Yes, Casey? Oh, sorry, I, want to, I was just wondering uh, who chooses the community contributors and especially if you have a divisive issue on a finite table, um, how, how do those people end up at the table from this online or distributed community? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a like, uh, unwritten rule that, because we, we can't just open the space for everyone, just as we are afraid that maybe there are too many people. So uh, this place, I mean, this for the civil society should be open only to the participants that have contributed in the earlier stages. Like if I'm a one, uh, I'm the one who have, uh, posted comments or have voted on police survey and then I get the tickets and well we got the invitation letter from the uh, editor of the Vitaiwan platform and then I get to join and I get to to this uh, meeting so I can sit here and also um, uh, we have some lists uh, we have a list of some longtime contributors of V Taiwan, like like an old friends or an old community or groups. So, and also they will get an inv invitation letter from the editors. So they have they got invited, then they can get registered on the KKTX uh, web page. Then uh, we will they can get to sit here. So the unwritten rule is that um, uh, if you want to sit right on the table, then you need to at least have contributed to, contributed to the earlier stages. So we won't have, I mean, like a sudden or someone, something out of nowhere, I and mean, then interfere with the process. Yeah. Hello. Uh, how do you, just to follow up on that, <laughs> how do you prioritize that selection. So if, if say for this issue, there have been a hundred people who mm -hmm. participated in uh -huh. the earlier part. So then how do you, yeah, how do you prioritize the three that get selected or invited? <laughs> um, what, prior, sorry. 
valid question, but we never had to deal with that. So basically, um, yeah, the, the original rule is that we, we invite people who have made constructive um, contributions from the earlier stages, but it's subjective what's, contrib what's constructive. So we end up mostly just sending out invites to everybody, right? So, uh, but out of the hundreds of people who participated online, because they know there will be a live stream that they, they can enter into the live stream in the comfort of their living room, uh, and it will be channeled by the facilitator. It turns out it's just people with really, with really a lot to say will actually show up in the face-to-face -face meetings. So out of the hundreds of uh, contributors or dozens of contributors, we, we actually, the most problem is that we only get like three or four um, people interested in it or even two people and we had to ask uh, that like more people to join. We, we never had to deal with the issue of like more than 20 people want to join the face-to-face -face meeting. I think mostly because they know that they can participate also very effectively through the live stream uh, venues. But yes, it will be a problem if um, more than 20 people register, but we never had to deal with that. So yeah, now that we are, we have two, a few people uh, willing to travel all the way or yeah, to be present in person. Yeah, but people would like to participate online, preferably uh, uh, from our experiences. Yeah. Okay. Could you? Yeah. Um, so this is just a question of like outlook and orientation, but like, is the aspiration to have as broad a, a population of people as possible participating, or is it to get like uh, like really motivated stakeholder groups participating? I'll just give a quick example from the U.S. context, right? Like, you know, everyone in this room is, I'm sure, familiar with the National Rifle Association, and we see this like the NRA has a degree of. Um, we, we see like asymmetric uh, intensity of preferences. Like most Americans feel like there should be certain kinds of gun control and so on. And a, a very vocal minority, you know, often exhibits like outsized power to block that. In this case, you know, like the the NRA is is a group of like, we could call them like asymmetrically partisan or, or asymmetrically motivated, right? Do we want in the V Taiwan example, do you do you want to see like the people who are most passionate uh, about an issue? So the advocates for uh, for for victims of online bullying or you know non consensual image sharing in this example, do we want them? Do we do you want like as representative uh, a subsection of the Taiwanese population generally to participate? How do you think about like goals for for this? Because I'm yeah, that that influences the the interface and the design and the process too. You know. Uh, so, I mean, to be more inclusive and also including the, uh, I mean, the, the people with direct interest, like, because uh, we, we did have a problem that uh, how we in attract people, especially those like the victims and the actual actors, him or herself, to be present at this meeting, but we find that it's mo almost impossible for them to be, to be in person participating in this this consultation meeting. So we use the uh, live streaming channel and also open up a chat room for them. So maybe uh, we, because uh, TWRF, the nonprofit organization, they did have uh, lots of cases uh, helping the victims of NCI case. So we encourage the TWRF to send uh, the link of this live streaming channel to the victims and also maybe the, the actors maybe, I'm not sure, to invite them and encourage them to participate online so that they can get shielded from exposing their identity and they get to express their comments. But I'm not sure, according to the, the chat room, the records, I'm not sure whether they did uh, participate in this consultation meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, sorry. Oh. My question is about how the issues uh, are defined at the outset for at the, at the start of this process. I mean, once you've gotten to this point, you have a lot of buy-in already mm -hmm. that these are important issues that everybody needs to be talking about, but how does that process start? Uh, I mean, from this proposal stage, original the proposal because uh, I I um, I have I have said the proposal including the two points as 
the criminalization of these act because it was not that specifically resolved with the criminal act of v Taiwan current current criminal code so uh, originally it was about all about the criminal criminalization of this action but then uh, after consulting with or interacting or discussing with so many participants then uh, we do find that it's it could be broader but well, personally, I, as a facilitator, I thought I think that it's really hard to uh, to figure out. I mean, to prioritize what uh, what should be the top issue and then the second issue, then because this should be calm as a whole. So, um, so some also some of the participants did do not uh, did not agree with the original proposal as a criminalization of the actors. So, um, Ari, can you help me with this? How do we converge? Yeah, there's no prioritization. Um, B Taiwan um, has concurrently processed, I think, like up to five topics concurrently. So um, as long as there is interest and time, really, uh, from the civil society actors who want to work on the process, and that the responsive authorities are willing to at least uh, give a, a binding response uh, to the synthesized uh, outcome. That's like the minimum requirement, like some buying from the civil society and some buying from the competent authorities. But they need not to go all the way to the minister. As long as there's some agency who want to show up in the mini hackathon, that's the, the like bare minimum. So it's actually very easy to, to create a new uh, Vitaman topic, but it doesn't always end up in this full process. Uh, sometimes after a few rounds of discussion, uh, we amend the scope. Uh, for example, the sharing economy proposal eventually became the platform economy proposal and, and things like that. So, so all of this is very flexible and it's all dependent really on the people who show up at mini hackathon every week. Uh, as long as people feel it's ready, well, then it's up for the uh, police or whatever other online um, opinion gathering. But that cooking stage, it may take half a year. It did take half a year for UberX. Just one more question. Um, hi, so I think you mentioned earlier that you do 15 tours around Taiwan. Um, so for people who have a disability who are unable to join your live stream or people with low tech proficiency or no access to the internet, what, where in the process can they be, participate in a, a one of the case studies or how else have you been able to reach out to those communities and engage them? Uh, v Taiwan is now funded by National Development Council. So now most of the cases on v Taiwan are uh, according to uh, the policy of NDC. And um, we, uh, so v Taiwan now uh, most uh, discuss about the issues uh, related to technology and law. So we think that uh, according to the the substantial, I mean, the nature of these issues, because they are all uh, about internet and technology. So now the participants are also should be someone who have the access to internet. So that there there should be the right stakeholders. But as also you mentioned that so for the I mean near future or distant future that we might need to include more uh, also those without the access to the internet um, be Taiwan. But for now, because all the cases and topics uh, resolved on be Taiwan cases are all about technology and law. So we. Yeah, the right stakeholders. That, that's, that's right, because yeah. what Avros talk about is the minimum requirement, but there's many people who show up in mini hackathon, for example, the Human Rights Association, uh, that they care a lot about, uh, for example, the equality of access of disadvantaged people, and they will go, go around and run their own meetings, their own consultation meetings, and some legislators actually run their own consultation meetings in the social enterprise case, and things like that. And, and the good thing with v Taiwan is that as long as the organizers show up in the mini hackathon, and as long as they want to, they agree to publish the transcript or the recording under a Creative Commons license, we do include it in the V Taiwan website 
proper. So, so what, what we just talked about is the, like, the minimum amount of meetings that would go into a VTOM process. But in reality, people actually go uh, to their constituents and hold complementary meetings that are nevertheless added to the VTOM timeline and become their synthesized documents still become the agenda for the further stage uh, discussions. But that, that can, the NDC cannot, um, you know, fund all those meetings. So basically it's up to the organizers in the mini hackathon to say, hey, we're, I'm going to the indigenous you know, nations <laughs> to, to have another discussion about this and please add it back uh, to the synthetic document. That's more or less what often happens when people uh, strongly feel that there is a component that cannot uh, be reached by the usual uh, venues. F following question, how are those comments integrated back into the, the master document, so to say? They're very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but it's a manual process. There, there is no um, automatable process in doing it. So, which is why we emphasize so much the um, need for facilitator to be involved as early as possible, right? So if the facilitator for a specific topic is neutral-ish uh, to this uh, topic and is involved from the very early stage, then they can uh, work with the organizers, uh, other organizers who show up at a mini hackathon and work out a strategy that works for both of them uh, to integrate these into the hackpad and uh, synthesize documents. And it really varies a lot uh, case by case. There really is no no SOP, a standard operation procedure for this, but the facilitator being, uh, you know, recognized by the mini hackathon contributors as their bona fide of, you know, holding a neutral and inclusive ground, I think is what makes V Taiwan working so far. But yeah, there's going to be a large debate about two months from now when the National uh, Digital Communication Act is passed and v Taiwan has a uh, chance of being institutionalized in regulation. At that point, we will have to figure out the parameters of how much to institutionalize and how much not to. But so far, that discussion has not been uh, happening. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll save our, the rest of our questions for the for the workshop part of it or the interactive part of it. For now, we're going to move into the lunch part where I'm going to introduce Tina, who's both a designer and a chef, and who has designed for us and cooked for us this amazing meal. And Tina will tell us a little bit about her thought process and how she was inspired by Be Taiwan uh, to cook us this wonderful meal. Sorry, I worked in tech for six years and don't know how to use it. So that's just how things are. Um, cool. So I hope you guys are hungry because uh, we're about to have lunch. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about how I thought about this lunch. Um, I wanted to create something that would help you process the themes that you talked about so far and encountered um, briefly. Um, also give you a chance to like socialize and get to know one another because it's a very rare opportunity that such a diverse and like wonderful group of people are together in the room. And lastly, um, approach this as a, a very playful experience. So, you know, they're, you're talking about very like important topics. Um, so I want lunch to be an opportunity where you can kind of um, play and employ your senses. So um, these are, when I was uh, designing the lunch, I was thinking about sort of reflecting the themes that we, uh, you will have encountered so far. Um, and since the first day is focused on the V Taiwan process, I looked at these themes, um, themes, uh, specifically how it's very consensus driven and invites diverse perspectives into the room. Um, and at some level it requires the diverse perspectives to come together and compromise, um, to draft a final like proposal and also transparency throughout the process. So it's broadcast for all to see, and you can understand each piece of decision-making that goes into it. Um, and so when I was thinking about like consensus and bringing multiple things into the room, I 
immediately gravitated to hot pot. <laughs> And so I thought about how um, this is a, an opportunity for different flavors or perspectives to mesh in a single, uh, very participatory format of eating. And the interesting thing about hapa is that it exists in many other cultures as well. Um, and the bottom left there is oden, which is, you can sort of think of it as Japanese hapa. It's like this big... Um, container of broth that different ingredients cook in all day and the broth slowly takes on the flavor of whatever was added to it. Um, on the bottom right, we have Jamaican pepper pot, which sometimes is thought of as like a big pot that you can bring ingredients and add to and it always varies depending on who makes it. Um, as well as, you know, different different forms of like stocks and broths and soups. Every, every culture kind of has its own idea of like this, this like melting pot or like, um, like using water as the vehicle to mesh flavors. And it's funny, while I was doing the research for this, um, Cordelia, where is she? Hi, she sent me this video, which turns out that the V Taiwan, or uh, all of our Taiwan friends have come up with the same idea and used it to create a video about how Hot Pot is the perfect collaborative consensus building uh, scenario. So I invite you to find the link later and check this out because this video is awesome. Um, so introducing our lunch exercise, Consensus Hot Pot. And it will be a giant pot of broth that we will all collaborate on to determine the final flavor. So for this to work, um, I need everybody to look at the, wait, where's Darshna and CS? Okay. <laughs> That's cool, you just like popped up. Um, so could you guys help people form five teams? And then, yes, they could be by the color of the dots. So the dots will come in later too because that's how, um, that those are the teams you'll form for the workshop. So find, find your teammates now, and then each of you will receive a placard with ingredients on it. Now when you receive the placard, you will see that every team has different ingredients assigned to them. And your task is to deliberate amongst your group and nominate two or three ingredients from this. And at the end, we will all come together and I will put all the ingredients up on the board and you can see like kind of what the other groups have nominated and we will do a final deliberation process as an entire group to determine what goes in the pot. So let's get started. If you don't have a dot, that will also form a group somewhere. So pair, pair with your colors. Maybe we can get uh, red, red dots, red dots where Devin is, orange dots over here where Noel is, yellow dots over here where Matt is. Blue dots back here. Hang out with the blue dots. So we've got yellow dots, red dots, yellow, yellow dots are over here at this far table. Or wait, are you over here? Okay, yellow's here, orange, red, green, green group, blue group. If you don't have a dot, join a group. Join a group, any group, join a group. This blue group could use some people. Avros, why don't you come back? Okay, I'm gonna hand out some sheets to your groups. Here you go, Enjoy. <laughs> and there you go. Great. Yeah. So you want to pick two, two, three. If 
you want to join a group, feel free to join that one. You want to join a group? Oh, that's okay. Two to three options. All right, how's everyone doing? Do we have a final decision amongst your group? Okay. Can I get your attention, please? Clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. Awesome, that works so well. <laughs> so do you guys have a decision? Excellent, let's get started with the final deliberation. I hope this works. Um, who's, who's at the computer right now? Can, can you click on the link that says, let's begin? Thank you, CS. Enter anonymously, that's fine. Yay. 
cool. This worked, yes, <laughs> technology worked. Um, cool, so let's go through each of the groups and I would like you to tell me which ones you've nominated for the pot and I will drag them into the circle to indicate your selection. So let's begin here, team one. Miso, uh, Remiso and, and Ginger. Um, and uh, we agreed on a mild, moderate portion of Oat Bay, but I don't know how to represent that okay. in, in Miro. But, but yes, roughly on one. The chef will keep that in mind. All right. So we got red miso. What was the third? Oh, ginger. Okay, where is group two? Are you guys group two? All right, uh, what are your selections? Uh, we, we have fermented black bean and garlic with a request to make the Frank's Red Hots available to people, but not actually in the pot so they can apply as desired on an individual basis. Good choice. Are you three? Four? Yeah. Three? Yeah, garlic, sorry, garlic and fermented black bean. Yeah. Three? We would like to put forth Sichuan peppercorns and tahini and a mild amount of chili powder. Unless everyone likes spicy food, then put it all in. <laughs> oh, hey. uh, hi, this is team four. Uh, our consensus was around black peppercorns, pepperoncini, and sake. Um, hopefully we can drink the sake as well. What was our decision? Um, we wanted onion and kombu. We wanted um, the kimchi on the side. And then we had a question about how well the carrot would actually work. Would anyone else like to risk it? We're saying maybe not. Carrot juice. That was our feeling too, so we'll keep it out. <laughs> okay, no. The motion has been denied. All right, so onion was the last one. All right, cool. How does everyone feel about this? We have Old Bay, ginger, garlic, red miso, fermented black beans, peppercorn, pepperoncini, I can't even read that, Sichuan peppercorn, chili powder, kombu, which is seaweed, um, and tahini, sake, and yellow onion. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, are there any allergies I should be aware of right now? The broth is currently vegan. Yep, and all of the hot pot skewers are gonna be vegan as well. So, does anyone? If not, we have plenty of dumplings as well. <laughs> all right, no objections? Going once, twice, and done. All right. <laughs> Democracy. You guys can all move over there. Please bring your chairs with you and you can see wherever you like. There are these little clusters of um, tiny crate tables. So just grab a seat. You can go ahead and start mixing your dipping sauce in your little like cardboard boat container. And I will start making the broth and bringing out skewers as they get ready.